here with news you can use. We've got two segments tonight. We're going to first talk about the big quit. And I'm going to read you an article that uh, came out in, I think it was the journal uh, yesterday and uh, yesterday morning. And they're now calling this the big quit. Let me just read it to you verbatim so you can read this. After we get done with this, we're going to talk a little bit about the opposite side of what I discussed last week, which is we have a housing shortage of 6 million homes. Uh, there's a, a group of folks that are out there arguing strongly that we have too many homes. We have glut, the opposite direction. So anyway, let's start with the good, uh, the, the big quit. The number of people quitting their jobs has surged to record highs. According to data released from the Labor Department on Tuesday, this would be yesterday, over 4 million people, or roughly 2.9% of the population in the U.S. quit their jobs in August. This is an all-time record. We have never had anything close to that many people quit in one month. In a year, many times in a year, you don't have 4 million people quit their job. We had 4 million people, almost 3% of the entire population of everybody in the country quit their jobs a uh, month and a half ago, uh, the month of August. The hardest hit, it goes on to say, the hardest hit industries include hospitality and retail, where employees are leaving because of long hours and a lack of flexible work options. Labor Department data shows that about 892,000 workers in restaurants, bars, and hotels quit in August, as well as 721,000 workers in retails. There's, a, there's also a monetary component uh, that's going on here uh, to this so-called great resignation or what they're now calling the great quit. Employees are less willing to endure convenient hours, inconvenient hours, for less than optimal compensation uh, than they were before the panic, uh, pandemic, I'm sorry. So this pandemic is still having reverberations. It's changing the economy. It's changing the way that people think about work. Um, and keep in mind with, you know, basically 3% of the entire population quitting their jobs. These aren't people getting fired or jobs disappearing. These are people who just walked in one day and said, I quit. Uh, that's a huge amount. It's a big, uh, and it's not even reflected yet in the unemployment numbers and things like that. That won't happen until the end of next week, this time next week. But you're going to see a real backlash. You know, they're going to say, oh, there's economic doom and gloom and so on and so forth because of this. But in reality, this is a voluntary thing. Um, we're going to see how this affects the housing market. But when you have, once again, 4 million people that were getting a paycheck today, that are not getting a paycheck tomorrow. Some of those people have rents to pay and mortgages to pay, and they won't be able to do it. I don't know why these guys are doing all this. Uh, you know, I was raised back in the day with a father and grandfather who, you know, any work is good work type thing. Any, any honest labor is a, is a good way to go. Um, not that, you know, there's anything dishonest going on here, but I just, I find it hard to believe that, uh, other than there's so many options out there for a lot of people to get, uh, you know, jobs that, uh, folks are doing this kind of thing. So we'll see how this affects our, our industry and what's going on there. Um, you know, overall, anything that is a downturn in the economy, and this has to be viewed as a downturn is bound to adversely affect the housing market. So we'll see what's going on there. All right, that's part one. Part two, uh, as I mentioned, is a follow-up to what I discussed, I think, last Thursday, which was, you know, some of these prognosticators out there in the marketplace are saying that we are, you know, there, it's the chicken little syndrome. They're running around saying that we're short huge amounts of houses, that we can't possibly build enough. And they're primarily, this is the realtor community, the talking heads in the realtor community, and they're trying to fan these flames to keep prices up is basically what they're doing. They're, they're saying, you know, there's not enough houses. And so there's overbid situations. And we've talked about the days of the dramatic overbids uh, are over. Um, will you, in some cases, if you're selling a house, get uh, multiple offers and some at above asking price? Yes. If you price it, slightly low and you've got nothing, uh, no what we call functional obsolescence in the house. In other words, in great shape. It's the nicest house in the area. Uh, it's got extra added features, that type of thing. Yes, uh, you can definitely get overbids and those kind of things, but it's not happening in East Overshoe, Iowa anymore. It's not happening in Dallas, Texas. It's not happening in Charlotte, North Carolina. 
with with few exceptions around the country, you're not seeing tons of overbid situations. Now, um, this article that uh, we're going to play, this video clip from CNBC uh, yesterday, I think it was, is going to talk kind of the opposite side of that. We're going to look at how the home building aspect is affecting not just the number of houses on the market today, but how the home builders view this thing and how they're doing to help or hurt. So let's, without further ado, let's, uh, uh, some of this, I've only listened to the first half of it, but I read the clip, the article of it, it's really informational. So let's go ahead, actually, and play this and we'll see what we can learn. Talking about a housing shortage, why do you think we could end up with a glut? Yeah, it's, uh, thank you for having me on, I appreciate it. Um, I think it's a great question. It's one that we tackled in this uh, thematic report you mentioned, Cradle to Grave, which we published about six weeks ago. Um, I think what you, you note at the beginning is that the number of homes for sale is at historic lows. And I think we've always struggled with that being the uh, litmus test of whether we have enough inventory or not. You go back to 2005 as an example, month supply in January of 05 was 3.8 months. It was the lowest ever at that point. But that clearly misread what was actually happening from a supply demand standpoint. And so what we did in this report is really take a step back and say, we know there's a cyclical benefit right now from interest rates falling from the pandemic. But once you sort through that, you're gonna be left with core demand and core demand really ties back to demographics. And the demographic piece is really what's gonna dictate how much supply we need over the next couple of years. And while we believe that right now, demand is very strong, as you get past those factors, uh, there's a downward trajectory of population growth, household formation as well. That's really gonna undermine the need for what's being built. And on the other side of that, you have the development community that's actually very optimistic about there being a housing shortage and actually very optimistic about how much needs to be built. And they're actually pressing the accelerator harder um, than we think they probably should be. You know, Diana, I'd like to have you react here. We've just been running uh, the names of some of the companies in the home building area, and they're all up uh, pretty strongly today. Uh, my experience by observation is that builders build. They love to build, and sometimes they overbuild, uh, which really dovetails, I suppose, with uh, what, our, what Dennis is saying here. What are your thoughts here? And, and, then, and then let's not forget that there are different segments within that building community. Some are uh, more focused on the lower end, uh, entry-level houses. Some are, uh, like Toll, uh, focused on the higher end. Yeah, and that's exactly the point, Tyler, is some will benefit, some will not. If you look at where the demand is, it's on the low end of the market, and that's where the market is really tightest. I mean, the Realtor.com put out a report saying we're actually short 5.24 million homes because of high demand and low supply, and so much of that is on the low end. So I think those who benefit are your DR Hortons and your KB Homes, who through the long term are going to be building that entry-level product that is so much demand now and so much more in the formation. Those in the middle, your Lennars, your Pulte, maybe your Taylor Morrisons who are building that step up home, they, you know, if Dennis is right, they may be the ones who are stuck in that oversupply situation. Mm -hmm. Toll Brothers, the luxury, they're in a very small niche. They're an $800,000 house, and that's going to be based on farther up move up buyers and more based on the economy for people who want that luxury home. So I wouldn't put it in that. But again, the shortage that we're seeing now, you talk to any real estate agent, anyone out there trying to flip a house, it's rough out there. And when you look forward, the builders are not building as much as we would expect to them, even given this shortage. So Dennis, the, what's happening here is you basically think that the builders are not taking into account slowing population growth and that we're already uh, surpassing demand by 20 to 25 percent for single family homes. In which case, when is that going to catch up with the builders and is it going to flip prices and supply for the whole industry? Yeah, and I, I'd be careful just to isolate this down to home builders because you have home builders who bring supply. You now have single family rental companies who are bringing a lot of supply to build for rent and you have multifamily developers bringing supply. So all three of those pieces have seen a very big step up in optimism on the development side. And it is going to take some time for that to come to market, whether it's developing the community, building out the infrastructure, developing the multifamily building, which might take 12 or 18 months. So you're going to have a period of time where the supply is unaffected, unaffected by the demand, but it's going to be coming pretty aggressively. And what we point to on the demographic side is all these, all these analyses that are talking about how short the housing market is for, for number of units. It's all based from a supply standpoint. It's all based on looking at history and saying, these are many, this is how many, how many housing starts we've had historically. That means we should be building something similar today, but they're not taking into account is that demand demographically is on a downward trajectory. 
you had, if you look at household formation this past decade, which is data just came out recently with the decennial census, it's about 24% below where household formation was in the prior four decades. So why are we using history to gauge how much we need going forward from a demand standpoint when we have an entirely different demographic circumstances behind that? Thank you, Ashley. All right, so. Goodbye, peel bottom. Brings up some real interesting things. I believe this is probably closer uh, to the real truth of the matter. Uh, and, and the biggest thing that he's pointing out there, and the reason that uh, they they ascribe to the fact that there's a glut of houses, not a, a deficiency, is because there's been a changing demographic. Um, I've talked here recently, the last couple of months, about the way the economy has come out of the pandemic curve is some of the rich are getting richer and some of the poor are getting poorer in this country. And the market is short of product for sure. In other words, there's not enough houses, not enough supply for the demand, but it's at the starter level. So the lower priced, uh, smaller, uh, you know, type starter homes. It's not at the, the, the up the middle uh, uh, markets. He talked about those builders that are in the middle markets or even at the top of the market, which is like Toll Brothers. So you're seeing uh, some real interesting things going on out there. And I think I'm actually seeing this. There's a, I'm, I'm keeping a close eye on a market in particular that I have some interest in in Northern California called El Dorado Hills. El Dorado Hills is part of a community around Folsom Lake, which is east of Sacramento. And you get a lot of people coming out of the Bay Area, the San Francisco, San Jose, uh, Bay Area, where prices, it's landlocked. There's no building. They haven't been able to build for years there. Um, you're between the mountains and the ocean. They just can't build anything more. And, you know, the prices have gone up and up and up and continue to go up in spite of the fact that, um, you know, there's been some hits to the economy in that area during COVID. Uh, you get in a lot of people who are fleeing the Bay Area and moving to like this El Dorado Hills area. So I've been watching the stats there. And for the last seven days, uh, there were 40 new homes listed in a zip code that I'm watching in particular. The prior seven days, there was four homes. Now, that was as of two days ago. In the last two days, there's been another 35 homes in two days listed. So there's 75 homes in the last nine days on the market versus, I think, five in the previous. So you're seeing a lot of people, um, and some of these are, this is maybe a higher price district. This would be the area that People would move out of the Bay Area, San Francisco, San Jose to come east. This is where they would go. Um, and But no market can sustain in, in, a, in one zip code that many high-priced homes coming on the market all at the same time. And you're seeing it. Uh, you're actually seeing where the market had been. It stayed pricey. Uh, you know, there's one or two or three homes on the market and then 75. And it's like, and, and they're all running for the bottom of the market. You know, whoever can get the cheapest, highest value uh, price on the home they want to sell will be the first ones to sell. And then the next best value slash price will be the next to sell, so on and so forth. And that's literally what's happening. I thought it would take longer than a nine day period of time. But uh, to me, it's a it's a feeling of the rats leaving the ship, the sinking ship. You know, the first one's off. Uh, probably going to be able to get out there and get onto something that they can survive on, but the rest of them could get stuck and watch this thing run all the way down. So we'll see. That's at a higher higher level, middle to upper middle to high level prices of the houses market, you know. But I still think there is a big shortage at the starter home market, and that's where we always encourage everybody to really kind of cut their teeth in this business. That's the safe spot because. Starter level homes, uh, first time home buyer type homes uh, are always in demand. If the economy's up, they're in demand. If the economy's down, they're in demand. There's always a demand for people who want to get their first home. And that, that market doesn't change uh, perceivably over a period of time. And that's the one where I encourage everybody to stay in. So at least in that slice of the market, I believe that you know, if if there isn't a de deficit between supply demand, there's, uh, you know, at least a real active parity level. I think there's actually a deficit. I think there's not enough supply in that level of market. So 
you keep your eyes open on the markets that focus on starter level homes and that's where you you know you you spend your time effort and energy when you're looking to buy homes those are the ones that i would bet on long term not the higher priced homes all right that's it for news you can use